Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Larry Rinder. I'm the director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and it's a pleasure to have you all here today for this very special program with two of the University of California's leading thinkers, Michael Pollan and Simon Sadler. Uh, as I'm sure you know, the conversation today is being held in conjunction with the Hippie Modernism exhibition that's on view here through May 21st. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, please come back. Um, we began to think about this particular program very early on. It was, uh, I guess, a no-brainer in a sense when you find out that Michael Pollan is uh, researching psychedelics and you're doing a hippie show, um, you know. And then uh, Simon, whose specialty is uh, hippie holism, I heard him speak when this exhibition opened in uh, Minneapolis, and he was really terrific. Uh, and he teaches at UC Davis, so that, again, a no-brainer. A no so uh, it's really wonderful to have both of you here. Um, so uh, journalist and author Michael Pollan is the Knight Professor of Science and Environmental Journalism at UC Berkeley. Uh, and for the past 25 years, he's been writing about the places where nature and culture intersect. And among his many, many acclaimed books, which most of you have probably read, are The Award-Winning Omnivore's Dilemma and The Botany of Desire. Uh, his forthcoming book, which is due early next year, and I can't wait, uh, explores the revival of psychedelic science uh, with the working title, How to Change Your Mind. Um, Simon Sadler uh, is the professor of architecture, architectural and urban history at UC Davis, and for decades he's explored how radical and avant-garde ideas have influenced art, architecture, and culture. Uh, so clearly uh, a really great person to be involved with this show, and indeed he wrote one of the most, uh, I think, penetrating essays in the exhibition catalog, which uh, you should check out if you haven't yet. Uh, he's examined how hippies, Marxists, urban architects, and utopians have tackled the proverbial question, do we make the environment or does the environment make us? Among his numerous publications are the critically acclaimed books, The Situation is City, and Archigram, Architecture Without Architecture. Uh, he's the author, as I mentioned, of a very wonderful essay in the catalog. And uh, we will also have here tonight Greg Castillo, who is uh, the guest curator for this exhibition. Uh, he is a UC Berkeley associate professor at the College of Environmental Design uh, right here on campus and has a specialty in counterculture design. He's written books on Cold War design, uh, and many articles about um, hippie design, among other things. So uh, after we have presentations by Michael and Simon, uh, they will join Greg on stage for a conversation uh, that Greg will moderate. So without further ado, Greg Castillo. Thank you very much, Larry. Welcome, everyone. Um, in curating Bamfa's ex, uh, installation of the Hippie Modernism exhibition that was originally created at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis by Andrew Blauvelt, both, uh, both Larry and I decided that we were not at all interested in creating a kind of flower power nostalgia trip. What we really wanted to do was to explore the 60s legacies of alternative culture, political resistance, intentional community, and how those might affect us today, what they might mean to us today, especially in our transformed political environment. Uh, so that's the goal of this series of discussion forums that accompany the exhibition. And uh, since I have you there as captive audiences, I'd like to uh, let you know about the two more hippie modernism forums that are coming after today's event. Two weeks from today, at the same place, in the same room, uh, we will have a fluid identities forum that will bring together counterculture veterans and scholars to dis discuss youth, gender, and radical identity, uh, racial identity cultures that emerged in the 60s to shape contemporary art and politics. And then on May 15th, there's a forum on creative communes that will consider the past and future potential of intentional communities. Uh, you'll find more information on both forums, on the website, and uh, as these uh, events are included with your entry to the museum, there's no reserved seating, so please uh, come early if you're interested in those. So, of course, today it's my uh, great pleasure to moderate a discussion with two distinguished University of California faculty members. And uh, a note about procedure, we'll start with 
uh, 10 to, minute, to 15 minute presentations by both guests, first Michael and then Simon, on their research and their entry point into today's discussion. Then uh, following these individual presentations, we'll move to a moderated discussion and then open the discussion up to all of you. So without any further ado, Michael, I uh, invite you to begin. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Larry, for that kind introduction. Um, well, I thought what I would do is help you deal with the cognitive dissonance of um, me, who you might think of as someone who writes about food, now writing about psychedelics. Um, it has been something of a transition. Uh, to me, it seems incredibly logical. Um, there are many ways to um, conceive of it, but one missing link is this, uh, mushrooms, obviously, which we can eat as food or consume to change our consciousness. And there's a lot of, a lot of things in the garden um, that allow us to do that, I've learned. So I'm going to just tell you how I came to, um, to uh, decide to work on this. Um, both the subject of psychedelics and the subject of food, to me, are about uh, the, the human engagement with the natural world. Uh, one of the really interesting things about us is our relationship to plants and, and fungi. And I'll, I'll lump them two together, even though they're different kingdoms. Um, we use uh, nature, we use plants and fungi to uh, nourish ourselves, sustain ourselves, uh, for beauty, uh, for pleasure, and weirdly enough, to change consciousness. Uh, humans have been using plants to change consciousness for as long as we know. I mean, there's evidence of cannabis use going back 5,000 years. Uh, psychedelic mushrooms in Central America probably go back that far. And the, the interesting question is why? Why should you do something that doesn't seem that adaptive uh, to do something that is going to leave you presumably more vulnerable to prey uh, in a discombobulated state? Um, and, uh, and there's no definitive answer to that question, but it's something that I'm exploring in this, in this book I'm working on. Um, but I sort of see drugs, uh, drug plants as, uh, as a kind of mutagen, um, the equivalent in the cultural sphere of, say, radiation in the natural sphere, which causes lots of mutations that leads to evolution, uh, evolutionary change. Uh, in the same way, changing consciousness may propose new possibilities to people, new solutions to old problems, um, and lead to cultural evolution. Uh, and so a, a long-standing interest of mine that predates my writing about food is uh, what I call the natural history of the imagination. Um, and that includes things like religion also. There is a natural history to religion in which psychedelics appear to have played a very important role. Um, so in the back of my head was this long-standing interest in, in figuring out this dimension of our relationship to, uh, to other species. Um, and then there were uh, two data points that made me think that, well, maybe it's time to leave aside the, the meal and, and look at this other kind of nourishment uh, for at least a while. Um, some of it grew out of the fact that I really like writing about new topics. I'm a journalist. I'm not an expert. And if you write about something long enough, um, you become an expert. And you can't write from that narrative stance of the learner, of the naive, of someone having an education. And I really like that narrative. Um, I, I really think readers prefer to learn along with you rather than being lectured from the beginning, here's the story. Um, so, and that became a little disingenuous uh, with food uh, for me. So that was one reason. The other was, though, these two data points. Um, one was, uh, and there were, there, it was interesting because one of them was Berkeley related. I was at a dinner party uh, up in the hills at a nice, somebody's nice big house meeting some people that uh, we didn't know. My wife and I, Judith, uh, was there with me. And we're sitting at this table and there's this woman down at the, you know, so it was a 12 people dinner party, 12 person dinner party. And there's this woman down at the end and she's I can't tell you who she is, but she's a kind of prominent Berkeley professor in her 60s, say. And, um, and I hear out of that corner of my ear, she's talking about uh, her LSD trips. And I was like, OK, people talk about that. And then it became clear from some time reference that it was like two or three weeks ago. 
And I was really struck by that. And, uh, and so, you know, you, you, there's a way you can focus your hearing um, when you need to. And, and I started uh, listening to her and what she was learning um, about consciousness, uh, which is, was her academic subject um, from these experiences, which were the first such experiences she had had. She, like me, had not had a lot of psychedelic experiences in college. I, I kind of happened to go to college at exactly the wrong four years, I think, <laughs> because I, I heard that there was plenty of LSD on this campus before I got there and plenty after I left. Um, but uh, so I came, I came late to the topic in, in that sense. And uh, so that was one data point. And the other data point was learning about a study that had been done at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and, and getting the papers and reading it. It was an astonishing study. Um, and it had a title like, uh, Psilocybin Can Reliably Occasion Mystical Experiences in People. And they had uh, experimented with a high dose of psilocybin. This is the ingredient in magic mushrooms, for those of you who don't know. And um, uh, in 80% of the people who got this drug, they had had a profound mystical experience that for all intents and purposes could not be distinguished from the classical mystical experiences recorded in uh, religious uh, writings and literature. Um, and not only that, that um, these experiences were um, uh, among the top five experiences of their lives as meaningful, and in several cases, they were the most meaningful experience in these people's lives. And um, in several cases, they were comparable to the death of a parent or the birth of a child in terms of their life-changing significance. And I thought this was really remarkable. How, how does that work? Um, what is a mystical experience? And if it can be uh, occasioned by a chemical. Um, and why should we be wired to have such experiences? Um, what, were their, what were their functions? And uh, so I began following the work in this lab at Johns Hopkins, which is really in America taken the lead in, in psychedelic research. And, um, and they moved on from that study when they saw what a positive effect. Oh, the other thing they found was that people who'd had these experiences, when they followed up with them six months later, these were adults obviously, um, that there had been a, a change in their personality, an enduring change in their personality. And um, those of you who are psychologists know that psychologists have five personality traits. I don't remember what they are, but um, <laughs> one of them is the trait of openness. Uh, your, your, uh, your, hus your, your, your hospitable hospitality to new ideas, new people, um, new experiences. And that this had gone up in this group of people and stayed up. And so they took this as a sign that maybe there was some therapeutic applications for this work and proceeded to uh, do a series of trials that are going on right now. Um, the one I followed closely for an article in The New Yorker uh, called The Trip Treatment was uh, the treatment of people with um, uh, terminal cancer diagnoses. Uh, and which seems like a totally weird idea to give psychedelics to people who are dying. But um, as it turns out, uh, it had a, a really profound effect on people in helping them um, cope with their diagnosis and reconceptualize their death um, because of the mystical experience they'd had. Uh, and I can talk more later about exactly how that works or how they think it works. The premise of the, 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 this research, though, is, is very interesting. One is that it's two points to make about it. It's not new research. It's a resumption of research that was done in the 50s and 60s. And this was one of the biggest surprises I had um, uh, going into this, which I, I really didn't know. And in fact, a lot of these research, younger researchers didn't know that before anyone ever heard of Timothy Leary, there had been uh, 15 years of very serious research testing uh, LSD and psilocybin in alcoholics, in people dying of cancer, in uh, people coping with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorders, and a range of other indications. And that, though these st studies were seldom up to modern standards, uh, because modern standards weren't really invented till 1962, the, the randomized controlled trial, for example, um, they were showing some very promising results. And the significance of the 60s in this story, in the scientific story, is that the counterculture derailed this work. Uh, the moral panic 
that followed on the, the, the embrace of LSD by the counterculture led this work to be stopped. Uh, and now, after all these years, it's finally, the, the thread of all that inquiry is being picked up uh, and resumed. And so it's a very exciting time. And, um, and I spent a lot of time interviewing patients, volunteers, doctors, scientists. And um, what's very interesting is that, you know, uh, we, f both philosophers and neuroscientists struggle with what they call the hard problem of consciousness. How do you link the, a mind to a brain? Can you link it? And um, one of the ways to understand a system uh, such as consciousness is by disturbing it. And uh, psychedelics do that really reliably. And, um, and in those disturbances, you can read a lot uh, about what consciousness is, uh, the role of the ego, um, what the unconscious is, um, because it all gets stirred, uh, the pot gets stirred by these experiences. So um, I want to leave it there. Uh, I've used up my time, and um, we'll be very happy to go further into these issues and, 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 and also talk about that counterculture moment and the role of psychedelics in shaping the 60s counterculture, which I think is really significant. So thank you very much, and I will turn it over to Simon. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for having me. I've got to do these reading glasses these days. This is a sign, at least, that I am indeed aging, but there we go. All right. So. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Michael. I'm with Michael Pollan. <laughs> and uh, I know. So, um, and Sherry as well, who's been doing stuff behind the scenes. So, you know what? I am naive. And um, of all the improbable things that could have ever happened in someone's career, it never occurred to me that one April Fool's Day, I would stand up in front of an audience at Berkeley and confess I've never done acid. <laughs> A combination of life circumstances, and I was just talking to M Michael a moment ago, and he was really attuned to this and very sympathetic to it. It's like, you know, drugs catch you maybe at certain times in your life, and other times they bypass. So a combination of life circumstances and a, self a sense of self-preservation have denied me this rite of passage. I was born too late for the acid boom of the 60s, and slightly too early for the acid revival in Britain that you see here around the rave culture of the 1980s and 90s. You know, maybe each generation has its own thing going on. The drug ecstasy uh, was more my specific moment, for better or worse, and for one reason or another. My genuine curiosity about acid has been sidelined by pressing matters like parenting and my efforts to increase my grip on everyday reality, not loosen it. <laughs> so I've never drunk the Kool-Aid. But that could be a good way in which to start the conversation this afternoon. What have I missed out on? Uh, what have others got in on? And then, given my seeming lack of qualifications as a discussant with Michael on almost any of the other subjects for which he's world-renowned, I'm also a vegetarian who hates cooking. Uh, <laughs> perhaps I can offer some redirects that contextualize my work with Michael's and with the truly extraordinary show on hippie modernism, which is being curated by Greg and is currently on show here. This is a slide of it installed in Minneapolis last year. Like Greg, I'm an architectural historian, and so one redirect I can try is to the far-out design of the 1960s that connected to psychedelia, to groups like Ant Farm, and I think, I don't want to mess this up, but anyway, this is um, a project by the Ant Farm Group. This is, uh, well, Greg will remember, 1960s. And it's a nice double kind of hit on this picture because this is also showing the Whole Earth catalog being edited. I think that's Stuart Brand inside the bubble there. Um, so there's Ant Farm and Archigram about which I've written extensively, and you can see that psychedelic moment hitting British architecture there in the 1960s. One of the first articles I wrote after arriving in the US 15 years or so ago was about Drop City, the iconic 1965 countercultural artist colony in Colorado. The colony was built from wonky geodesic domes. You know, the geodesic dome was kind of a big thing in countercultural architecture. 
and also from recycled cars. Students really kind of grok out when you show them this picture now. I just showed it very fleetingly in a lecture back at UC Davis a few weeks ago, and immediately students came to office hours. Tell us about the domes. <laughs> so, so they are kind of, you know, they're, they're very of the moment. Uh, they are made here. These were built from uh, chopped up, scrapped cars. And yes, of course, it was powered by the drugs that were being dropped there, you know, Drop City. <laughs> Aesthetically, Drop City captured the world as anti-Cartesian, crystalline, amorphous, images drifting through the commune's long-lost ultimate painting that you see in the foreground there. And moreover, I think that was designed to spin. And I should admit that Thinking toward today's conversation has had the effect on me rather aptly of switching background and foreground, pushing psychedelic drugs back to the fore of my understanding of this art and architecture. You know, I know that, of course, it's, it's acid, right? But, you know, over time you study this stuff and you see other factors that are in play as well. But acid, I, I realize, you know, of course it's acid. I usually prefer to interpret drugs as part of the ignition of creativity, Drugs have been significant to creative processes at least back as far as the Romantics. Thomas de Quincey entitled his 1821 memoirs The Confessions of an English Opium Eater. And over there on the right, Picasso repeatedly represented the consumption of absinthe here in a cubist glass of absinthe from 1914. Absinthe, that was a bit of a transgression. Before it was legal in the EU, uh, uh, I tried a little absinthe on, in a back street of Barcelona. It's amazing, strong stuff. <laughs> but to the degree that some of the works in the current show might extol drugs as their actual subject, and we're trying to reproduce, reproduce their affect, I'm not always sure that they pass over the transom of great art, though I could be persuaded, and maybe that's something else we could talk about. More generally, though, my contribution can be that of an immigrant design historian trying to learn about an American countercultural sensibility, one that is particularly at home on the West Coast, to which my fellow countryman Aldous Huxley moved to kick open his psychedelic doors of perception, and which is at most at home in the Bay, and right here, of course, in Berkeley, whose university press brought psychedelic drugs into the academy with the 1968 publication of the teachings of Don Juan. For want of a better term, I approach this sensibility as one of holism. It's a term that Larry used earlier. Uh, you know, so what could holism be? You know, it, it can be traced back to Spinoza via Goethe. Goethe, and there's, I know there's disputes in the scientific historical community about whether he's really a holist, but still, look at this lovely poem. Uh, from Goethe, who wrote that in the contemplation of nature, you must regard the one as all. Nothing is within, nothing is without. Sounds like the 60s. Grasp thus without delay a holy open secret. Holism is a quality I found in Michael's work over and over again. Whether he's gardening, building, or eating, it seems to me, Michael asks, to what does this connect? What world does this make, and what does this make me? As a journalist, Michael's beat is slow news, the slow news of changes in food supply, diet, shelter. The news missed in the 24-hour news cycle, but sedimented in a long now. It is arguably the real news in a moment of fake news, news of what is happening to our species and other species. It's been his gift to us to cover these slow news stories with a concrete immediacy and humility that is, I wonder, a hippie modernism made good. Hippie modernism is the modernism of connection, not compartmentalization or fragmentation. Made good because through Michael's books and documentaries, an holistic worldview becomes less introspect, less mystic, and more shared, more reasoned, more collective in a sharing of common concerns. And I really think there's the sort of modernity of it. It's whether we can actually talk about this stuff, get it out into the open, have some transparency, and think about stuff that matters. Corn for example, he has shown, is everyone's business. It is literally us. Cannabis, he showed, has co-evolved with us, and I take co-evolution as a powerful key concept of contemporary holism. You know, that idea that we're all evolving together, that cannabis evolves with us, uh, that there are, there's no disconnect. 
Um, I hope this isn't too much of a, a shock for Michael, but there's his writing hut. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to know whether you've ever been, have, whether you've been back there, but the picture of a roof, he reminds us, is our medium with the weather and nature beyond our control. And the picture of the roof does double duty as a symbol with which we communicate with others about being home in the world. It was in reading his meditations on roofs, frames, windows, and sights that I first encountered Michael's work in his wonderful book, A Place of My Own, which recounts his struggle to build a hut in which to write. I took this less trodden path into Michael's work because, newly relocated to the US, I was doubling down on a project that I'd long thought about while still living in the UK. What, I wondered, as I thumbed through the impossibly exotic yet down-home pages of the Whole Earth catalogues that I'd bought in a used bookstore. By the way, that picture up in the left, that's the improbable place where I bought the Whole Earth catalog, the <laughs> Elephant and Castle Shopping Center. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of, I'm putting this juxtaposition there because it was, I want to give you the effect of sort of being transported out of living in um, London and reading about this stuff and kind of conceptually transferring myself uh, to California. And so I'd be looking at the Whole Earth catalogue in London and think, you know, what is it like to live within the catalogue's 1960s and 70s Californian worldview? I find it so alluring even now. You know, I'm still trying to get there, I think. Part of me is still trying to get there. One of Michael's best phrases is that some things, corn cooking huts, are things with which to think about our priorities, our culture, industries, materials, our sense of beauty and of order and of nature. The same goes, I decided, with the Whole Earth Catalogue. It's a design, an architecture that maps out this world. The Whole Earth Catalogue moved effortlessly from this to this to this. Michael's books move similarly, paragraph to paragraph, with mercurial curiosity, intelligence and subject knowledge. On the other hand, the catalogue seemed practical, a veritable handbook for the back to the land movement. And that same practical invitation to do, to experience, is lodged in Michael's books in which he plants and soars and hunts. Think, do, then write the experience down to share with others, a lot like Henry David Thoreau at Walden. And then for the rest of us who might not be doing as much thinking and doing and writing as we would like, we at least get to live vicariously and to learn through the books. As an outsider, I've been able to get up to speed on an American worldview, which, as Michael shows, springs from Thoreau and from others in the great canon of Jeffersonian republicanism, transcendentalism, pragmatism, and ecology. A lot of isms there, but I think it kind of maps together to fuse a certain way of being in the world. The exhibition on show here now is another vicarious experience, which is of a moment when, so to speak, Thoreau was on acid. It was a moment when Americans primarily could take the whole earth as a thing to think with, laterally, with ecological conceptual connections speeded up through computers and media as well as LSD. The world seen from the new frontiers of inner and outer space across the boundaries imposed by civil and mental government. Even when reduced to symbolism and nostalgia, the counter-design spirit remains a central rollicking asset of design in California, central to the state's global brand. How many of you are virgins? How many of you have taken LSD? Steve Jobs hectored Stanford students in 1982. In his legendary commencement speech at Stanford 23 years later, Jobs read from the back cover of the catalogue to urge students to stay young, stay foolish. Okay, so that leads me to conclude for now with a couple of possible questions for discussion. One is, can I flunk the acid test but still learn how to think with acidity? In other words, aren't we all holists now to the extent that we read Michael's books and we read Steve Jobs' biography and communicate cybernetically across time and space? And in the case of a few vegetables, at least in my fridge, I kind of sort of know where my food came from. Aren't we all now obliged to disrupt, collaborate, hack, make? 
Or am I? Are we still missing something? Is the exhibition here still a thing to think with, not something safely back in the past? As well as the end-of-life therapies about which Michael wrote so thoughtfully in The New Yorker recently, should we be getting loose in more areas of our lives? Or is Trump-era reality so weird for many of us that drugs are redundant, except <laughs> as an... <laughs> sort of semi-serious here, folks. <laughs> except as an escape. Might that not be ICE's dream come true? Californians tripping while their migrant farm worker neighbors are deported. Such an antinomy between doing your own thing and politically organizing recalls countercultural debates of the 1960s and 70s, those between the hippies and the new left, and between two forms of consciousness. One depicting the world as a place of reconciliation, there again is Drop City over on the right, and on the left, depicting the world as a place of struggle. This too is the dilemma I face trying to reconcile the different worldviews about which I've written. Competing with holism is a worldview we could term totality, stemming from the European left, which is revolutionary rather than evolutionary, urban rather than rural, politico-economic rather than cornucopian. It's an outlook I explored in a book about the situationists in Paris and Amsterdam, and in an essay I wrote for the Catalogue to Hippie Modernism, which you've heard about, I looked at the unlikely attempted collaboration in 1974 between the Whole Earth Catalogue editor and Acid Trips veteran Stuart Brand, who you see on the left there. He was based over in Menlo Park, and the Black Panthers based across the bay in Oakland. In their struggle, the Panthers, it's worth recalling, discouraged drug use. As hippies were imagining survival off the grid, the Panthers were imagining survival on the urban grid. Just 50 minutes drive from one another, they were worlds apart socially, racially, culturally, and geographically, cultivating two worldviews that overlapped but were ultimately incompatible, founded on different data, different experiences, different privilege, portend in the postmodern collage of competing identities, race, gender, sexuality, that was about to crack the universalism, the universalism of the hippies. And then finally, truly finally now, I realize I'm out of time, but still more worldviews keep coming vying for our attention. Another contemporary Californian worldview, from Donna Haraway's cyberculture on the left to Silicon Valley biotech towards the right, sees the restoration of wholeness in synthetic engineering, in zeros and ones and spliced genes. Neoliberalism, lately all dominant, sees the world's contents as just so much exchangeable monetary value while an upstart nationalism slashes borders across a world recently globalized. When I drop it, will LSD help me make more or less sense of this sum of overlapping worldviews? So with that, folks, uh, I'm done for my bit. Just an interesting slide, though, I think, to finish with, if, if, uh, if I can just interpret this for you. This has just come out. This is the result of a competition uh, to think laterally about the border wall, and the, pro the proposal here is to uh, build, instead of a, a fence, instead of a wall, a sort of water tank to irrigate both north and south of the border. But just the way that it's handled, you know, it kind of looks like the 60s and there's people picnicking and there's a farmer's market. It kind of <laughs> looks like Michael's world in a way, but just <laughs> completely dystopian. Uh, okay then, so thank you so much. Okay, thanks very much for two really stimulating and interesting conversations, uh, conversation starters. And uh, I would wonder, uh, picking up where you left off, uh, Simon, you know, if we're living in a world that seems so fragmented, that has so many competing realities, is holism a fata morgana for us? Has that Humpty Dumpty fallen off the wall never to be put together again? I mean, what could the role of holism and what I 
uh, presume is the pursuit of the use of psychedelics and therapy to actually br to integrate a character again. Uh, how, how can those things be reconciled? Can they be reconciled? Can I go? Well, I think this is one of the values of uh, Michael's books. You know, I, as I was joking, it's a, like a hippie holism made good. So, the, you know, there's like a long tail of each cultural revolution. And the gift of a real cultural revolution is that it takes decades to learn for the rest of us what, what had been thought back then. And I think there is an enduring value in seeing the world made whole. And I see that value being described to me in Michael's books. So that once you've read The Omnivore's Dilemma, that's it. You will never think about food again the same way. I mean, it's, this is true. Well, it depends on what level you look at holism. If you look at it at the level of ecology, it, it, uh, it simply is true. I mean, I know that's a not the way you speak in academic terms anymore. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the fact is there is a, that nature, as, as Goethe said in that wonderful quote, um, uh, is all connected and that you can deny it and try to fragment the world. But the image that Stuart Brand uh, introduced to the culture, that view of the earth from space, um, uh, which, by the way, his effort to obtain that image and, and, and convince NASA to take the picture uh, was the result of a NASA trip. I mean, that is where he got the idea. It's, it's, a, it's a story uh, perhaps worth telling. But that, that image had a, a profound effect on, on, um, on people's worldview. And it is interesting to watch Trump try to take apart that worldview now. Um, but whether this is just a backlash uh, to a to a story that will eventually move forward again, or it represents a real change. I just don't think you can undo that fact that it is that the Earth is a planet and it has an ecosystem, and wherever you draw the borders or, or erect the walls uh, is not going to change that. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that sense that the world is a whole system. Um, I you know I would say through looking at the whole Earth catalog and reading around counterculture and thinking about ecology and watching that ecological moment swing round again into the period of my own life, it feels again like an incontrovertible truth. Uh, when Michael says, though, that you know, the idea of an incontrovertible truth is not something we do in academia, and it's certainly not something you do down here at Berkeley, what you kind of register there is that although the whole Earth might be a closed single system, that still leaves everything up for grabs. How do we live within that system? How do we share it? What are we going to do about uh, equanimity? What are we going to do about borders and so on? But that's where I thought that the whole Earth catalog was such a supreme challenge. It's a thing of beauty, really, the darkness of those covers, the uh, modernistic, really, uh, representation of the Earth. There it is. And even if you never opened the catalog, the challenge of that picture, I think, and of those little uh, epigrams that you get on the back, you know, you can't put it together, it is together. Uh, you wouldn't have to open the catalog to just get the core message. Now, what you, how you act in the world beyond that, well, then we get over to Michael's books. Well, uh, picking up on the whole Earth catalog, uh, of course, that image of the Earth floating in space is a kind of mandala for the space age. And of course, the mandala is this attempt to create a graphic device that shows a totality, that represents everything whole. Uh, if we go, if you walk through the show, you'll see many kind of hi hippie mandalas, hippie era mandalas. And so um, uh, it's curious that from that era, the notion of an LSD trip is very much a uh, mystical experience, something that we've discussed, uh, one that's uh, really a kind of redolent of Eastern mysticism. Uh, and yet the therapeutic use is, in some ways, the Western opposite. It's a scientific use. Uh, are those qualities of the LS tri LSD trip or the uh, psychotropic drugs, are they so flexible that they can be either one? Yeah, I think one of the striking things about psychedelics is that they're, uh, they don't have any single meaning. 
and that they're user constructed to a really uh, profound extent like no other drugs are. I mean, it was Timothy Leary's big contribution in terms of the theorizing of, of LSD and, and psilocybin was uh, the importance of set and setting. Uh, where you are and what you bring to it will shape the experience in a profound way. So that um, it's very interesting that the 60s, by and large, constructed the psychedelic experience in very Eastern terms. I think that that's an accident of history and the fact that um, uh, Leary in particular and Huxley, whose, uh, whose book cover you showed, who, who had a profound, more profound than Leary's impact on how we interpret these drugs and, um, and, and had a strong influence on Leary too, that he, uh, he, was, he was immersed, drenched in Eastern mysticism. And so, uh, and so was Leary. And, and Leary decided that the Tibetan Book of the De Dead was the best guide to the psychedelic experience. It could have been different. Um, and that the fact that so much of the imagery is derived from uh, that construction um, is, I think, is in large part an accident of history. I mean, you could argue there are better resources for the psychedelic experience in Buddhism than there are in Christianity, but you know, there were some Catholic mystics who were very involved in psychedelics too, and they didn't have quite the same uh, same influence. Um, so it's a very weird thing, and the suggestibility is very important. You know, the CIA did a lot of work on psychedelics too in the 60s, in the 50s, and they thought it was a, a mind control drug or it could be harnessed as a mind control drug. And, um, and there were a lot of accidents that came out of that, including the fact that they dosed Ken Kesey. Um, and, and he went on to have a, a huge influence on the 60s counterculture. And you could argue that the whole 60s counterculture was a CIA mind control experiment gone, <laughs> gone horribly or wonderfully wrong. Um, they just gave it to the wrong guy. Um, but there is, so the, the, the drugs are protean in a way and, and can be harnessed for very different purposes. And, and actually one of the neuroscientists that I've been following in this, uh, a young uh, neuroscientist named Robin Carhart Harris who works in, at Imperial College, he's actually really concerned that in the wrong hands these drugs could do great damage to people even as they can heal them. Um, because they're so suggestible. And uh, therapists who have a Jungian orientation, when they administer these drugs to their patients, their patients will have Jungian imagery. And, um, and, and ditto if you're Freudian or whatever the orientation of the guides. And, and the guides, by the way, are saying very little during these experiences. Um, those who have a mystical orientation, their volunteers will have mystical experiences. Um, so, uh, that's why you. That's why citing um, LSD as a causal agent in the '60s counterculture is complicated. It's, it, it, it probably did introduce things to it that were important, but it also amplified things that were already there because people brought their ideas of what this trip was supposed to be like. And that's why Leary is important because he did he did help shape that. Um, there was a wonderful panel discussion maybe a decade ago now when Fred Turner's wonderful book Counterculture to Cyberculture came out. And so we hosted Whole Earth Catalog Editors uh, down at Stanford. And about mid, m midway, uh, in, very laconically, Fred says, uh, so let's talk about drugs. And it was a wonderful segment of the discussion because my sense listening to it was all of them are like, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, drugs are totally part of what we did. But again, it's kind of like an ignition point. And so beyond a certain point, it's not still about drugs it is an entry point that can go to other places. So the counterculture is not consistently about drugs. And then something else I was uh, thinking, listening to Michael is, so, you know, drugs could be, well, they are part of the counterculture, but are they completely central and completely necessary to it? And amongst the many interesting things that the Whole Earth Catalog presents is that byline at the top of it, access to tools. And so if we were to start to think then about uh, drugs as just being one tool amongst many, that there is Eastern mysticism, there are other belief systems, there are different sorts of actions, then it becomes part of a program by which we constantly work at making the world whole. But it's not just simply about the drugs. The drugs are a tool alongside other tools. And I was thinking again about this recently when I gave a short talk about the Lama Foundation in Taos, New Mexico. 
And I don't know whether they were doing drugs there. I think they were high on religion. And, um, you know, those very powerful beliefs, I realized, were one way in which to keep a community together for a while. Uh, and reading and talking and books. And again, I'm, I'm nearly as uncomfortable with religion as I am with drugs. It's not really my bag. But I can see why it works for people. And it's something I think, you know, as an historian, I, I need to respect. It's a tool. It's doing something. Oh, can I just do one more form? Because uh, on the way over, I was thinking, gosh, I really am a, such a horrible square. I really shouldn't go to Berkeley. <laughs> and then I thought, well, look, actually, um, some really interesting squares were around the counterculture. Uh, so there's Frank Zappa. Is, am I right? He didn't. He he didn't do drugs, or he 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 taught not all drugs, or and Buckminster Fuller, or then more lately uh, Prince. So I'm not trying to draw a direct connection between <laughs> me, Zappa, and Prince, but you know I'll put it out there. So it's a, so these are um, so the point that I'm getting at is that it's possible to think laterally to learn a way of thinking. Like you say, Buckminster Fuller. So it, it was a tremendous trip, I understand, to listen to him as he went this to this to this to this to this. But um, that's really a sort of habit of mind that he's learned there. Well, you asked a question earlier whether you had to take the drugs to, to enjoy the, the profits of the drugs. And the answer is no. Um, I mean, if this, if if you take my metaphor that this is a mutagen, that this is a that these are uh, that this is a tool, I think you're right to call it a tool. And Stuart Brand definitely saw them as tools, um, tools with which he became disenchanted eventually. Um, but that um, that they create changes, and then you live in the world created by those changes. So, for example, you mentioned the Romantics, and uh, not just De Quincey, but Coleridge, of course. Uh, drugs were very important to his practice and his whole con his whole reconceptualizing of the imagination the concept of the secondary imagination that breaks things down and throws everything up in the air and then it reconstitutes is an opium idea is an idea that is very much nourished by opium we are all descended from that concept of the imagination um, and we don't have to take opium in, in order to benefit from it so once the once the bomb is detonated um, not everyone needs to uh, to use it to benefit from it um, yeah, Brand on tools, uh, I interviewed him from the book, and we had a really, he's a very interesting, thoughtful guy, and he said at a certain point, um, on, the, on the move from uh, psychedelics to computers, he said the drugs weren't changing, but the computers were, or the drugs weren't getting any better, and the computers were getting much better, and, and the focus changed. But to just go back and tell that quick story, um, in case I left anyone hanging, um, uh, he's, uh, he's told the story a few times, but um, the idea of the Whole Earth Catalog and that image uh, grew out of uh, an acid trip he took on the roof of a building in North Beach in 66, I think it was. And he took 100 micrograms of LSD, which is a healthy but not outrageous dose, and went up on the roof and was looking at the city. And, um, and he noticed the, that, that, that all the lines of, of the urban grid were, were not straight, they were curving, and he said, oh, this must be the curvature of the earth that he was seeing. I don't know if he really was or not. Um, and, and then he asked himself this question, and it's exactly the kind of question that occurs to someone on, on, uh, on these drugs, which is, why haven't, the space program was well underway, and, and they had left Earth orbit, and they were on their way to these loops around the moon. Why haven't we seen an image of the earth from space? And he, and he realized that this, was, this, is, this is key, this is what mankind needed right now. And so he started a campaign. Uh, he had buttons printed up, and um, and he realized he, there was a, he he spent a lot of time phrasing it, and and came up with that slightly paranoid formulation. Why why haven't we seen the image of the Earth from space? As if they were they had it and they were hiding it. And uh, and he sold these buttons beginning in Sproul Plaza, um, and and then the San Francisco Chronicle picked it up. And it became this international sort of petition drive. And uh, I'm sure NASA would have aimed the cameras that way at some point. It would have been weird if they didn't. But, uh, and he doesn't exactly take credit for that fact. But then they did release that image in uh, 67 or 68 um, that uh, you know, had, had a galvanizing effect on the, on the environmental movement, among other things. Well, it strikes me as that image of the Earth from space as a tool 
uh, ends up being used or uh, has the, a parallel intention to the original uh, notion and the counterculture of how the tool of LSD would be used. In other words, it galvanizes a community. It basically allows you to understand a community. And clearly that's when Ken Kesey is saying, can you pass the acid test? Uh, his use of LSD is to create a kind of sacramental rite of passage for a community. It's very much how, if you look at the cultural history of the Haight-Ashbury district, how that district uh, sort of catalyzed with a kind of sacramental use of LSD. So uh, I guess w one of the questions I would have is that, is even that use of LSD quite specific to that moment? Uh, does it have any parallels to uh, its uh, rediscovery as a therapeutic tool today? Yeah, I don't think we can ever go back to that moment um, because what was, I think, and I think this is the significant contribution of psychedelics to the 60s counterculture is specifically this idea that you had a generation who was having a rite of passage that the previous generation had not had and would not have. So, you know, normally rites of passage is uh, knit a culture together, right? Young people do what, what previous generations have done. Every generation, uh, you know, you're bar mitzvahed, you have confirmation, you have, uh, you know, marriage, you have all these institutions. And you pass from the shores of childhood to the shores of adulthood, and, 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 and it knits everybody together. Here was what was undoubtedly a profound rite of passage, because it was so uh, radical in the way it changed your way of looking at the, at, at the world, yet you ended up in a place where there were no adults. And, um, and you had been left on a shore, and, and there was a gulf created rather than uh, knitting together. And I think that the generation gap, which was a term you heard a lot at the time, the fact that you had a generation of people that rejected their parents' ways, rejected their government's ways. Um, I mean, when in history has a generation of young men refused to fight a war when told to go fight a war? I mean, that was kind of a unprecedented um, act of independence. And uh, I think, so I think a lot of that was fueled by the fact that the frame of reference that millions of young people had um, was so radically different. Now we live in a world where, you know, if your kids take LSD, the chances are very good that you're your, that their parents did as well, and that they understand what it's about, and they're somewhat less frightened of it. Not entirely less frightened, but somewhat less frightened of it. And in fact, what we now have is a world where the people in charge have used psychedelics. And I think that's one of the uh, conditions that's allowing for this renaissance. I mean, that there are people in very high places at medical institutions, at the FDA, at all the places that have to approve this, that um, had you know, potentially very meaningful experiences on the drugs. So I think we passed out of that, that, that once in a lifetime uh, meaning of the drug into a set of new meanings. That periodization, Michael, reminds me of um, a story that a mature student of mine told me quite a few years ago when I first came to California. And he asked me, well, you know, actually, the first thing was he heard I was building a geodesic dome in my garden uh, for my kids, like one of those jungle gyms. And he says, I know how to build those. And I'm like, go on. So I, I, I gave him a little money, and he came around and screwed this thing together. And, but he told me something that was really kind of tragic, that he caught the tail end of that rite of passage. So he, his elder his elder siblings, they'd caught the tail end of the countercultural revolution. And when that finished, he was sort of stranded, waiting for the next kind of episode of history to begin, while this one ended lamentably. And so he was honing his geodesic dome building skills <laughs> in his mother's garden, his mother's backyard in Woodland, which is a town 20 minutes north of Davis, which is, you know, kind of more blue collar, more, more agricultural. And I said, you know, so how did that go? He said, it was really horrible. I was building the dome, and he said, I had a bag packed in case the draft came, and I had a route to Canada planned, and I just lived in fear every day. And he said, every, and the culture had gone. It was abandoned, and, we were, and I was left alone. Mm. Then thinking about that kind of periodization um, on my way out, uh, this morning, uh, I was talking to my wife, and uh, she says, so what's, what's it about? And I said, well, LSD, you know. 
She said, well, um, and her recollection of LSD, again, a different generation, was that it was kind of rough and that it, there was this sort of trickle-down thing. And for her, the connotations were completely different. And it got me thinking. I said, well, you know, um, I think in the 60s, it was kind of an elite thing in a way. That this was a privilege, really, to be in early. It was intellectuals, and I don't know whether anybody else got the email from a guy over, I think, in Vermont, was it? That Anyway, earlier this week, uh, a guy in his 80s, hearing about today's uh, meeting, today's talk, dropped a few of us a, an email and was saying about his early LSD adventures, and he must have been really early in, and I looked him up, and he was a super elite kind of guy, sort of trust fund sort of guy. So when we're thinking about the periodization of drugs, we could think about how they transition uh, through class, ethnicity, through phases of history. Um, Michael was dead on, you know, we're just, I think I might have mentioned this already, but when I was saying, you know, LSD, and, he, and you ascertained my age, and you straight away said, yeah, MDMA, right? And I was like, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> and th but that was an amazing rite of passage again as well in the, uh, in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, veterans of acid were, were doing, like, sort of compare and contrast. Like, yeah, the effect is different, and but it was a much more maybe communal feeling, uh, the sense of overwhelming love and oneness. So it wasn't just that sort of private experience or you know, potentially what could be a private experience in your own imagery, but instead you know, a sense of complete rightness, that I'm right here, right now, and these are the people I need to be with. And it was a point of view on the, on the world. It was wonderful. Mm. You know, one of the, the, uh, the other important links between holism and psychedelics is that to the extent you can generalize about the effects of the drugs, they tend to lead to a dissolution of ego, of a sense of self, when you when when you know a big dose is involved, and and the mystical experience, as defined by um, William James and others, um, is characterized by um, a merging of self with other, of a loss of a sense of distinction and and, and fragmentation, and this sense of it, it's that Goethe quote, which is very psychedelic, that we're all one. Um, and that you know that love uh, connects everybody, and um, uh, so that I, I think there's no, uh, th and I think that's one of the reasons it was such a powerful element in this in the counterculture was that it was a pharmacological way to give you that oneness experience that you might have understood intellectually. Um, but the, one of the other things about it is um, what James called the noetic sense, that something you may understand as a matter of uh, idea or, or ideology becomes a felt reality and becomes an objective truth and, uh, and, and, and held with a kind of religious or evangelical uh, fervor. And I think that that happened with this idea of oneness for a lot of the people involved. So, I mean, maybe we're move, moving towards some sort of sense of consensus here that what matters with these drugs, and maybe not just LSD, but through successive drugs like MDA, MA, and prior drugs, you know, not least maybe alcohol or maybe pot or absinthe, absinthe I'm not sure, but that sense of the all one. The, is it the case then that drugs get kind of rediscovered generation after generation after generation as a tool for accessing that point of an all one that is constantly ground under through the necessities of everyday life, mm. um, that it doesn't necessarily have to come through drugs, it can come through religion. Uh, you know the all one thing, do you, you know Dr. Bronner's soap? Have you ever? <laughs> he did it through soap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's a, if you ever see the I think they may have reduced the manifesto a bit on that bottle, but it's terribly Californian. And it's quite the trip reading this if you have a spare couple of hours to read the label. And, um, you shouldn't take showers that long, I think, in, uh, in California. <laughs> and I was... Uh, uh, actually, I was on a bike ride a few weeks ago, and I, I saw this car stopped, and it had a sticker on the, on the bumper sticker. It said, all one. And I'm stopping looking at it, and the young owner comes up and he says, yeah, all one. And I'm like, yeah, all one, man. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he'd been an employee of Dr. Bronner's soap. Um, but there was somewhere I was going, so the rediscovery, right? So the rediscovery 
of drugs as a tool, as a way of kind of overcoming inhibition. But then I guess, you know, the, the, the question of questions is, as well as religion, as well as drugs, you know, what is then the role of reason in understanding a sense of solidarity? And then the danger is, is, is does kind of dropping stuff become a substitute for political organization, right? That this, it, the, the, the sense of solidarity, is it something that we can carry back into everyday life? It's a, it's a fact, we're all one. You know, you can't leave the ecosystem. And um, yeah, so it, it's a tool, but uh, if it becomes a crutch, then you know, maybe that's the... Yeah, I mean, I don't know that... Uh, the, the relationship of, of, uh, of psychedelics and the, and the political left was very complicated. I mean, as you said, the, the, uh, the Panthers were not interested in psychedelics. Although it was interesting, um, Timothy Leary uh, um, fled to Algeria when Eldridge Cleaver had a government in exile there and sought sanctuary when he was, he, he escaped from a prison in California he, and, um, and was spirited out of the country by the weathermen and ended up, but he, he, he really didn't like Eldridge Cleaver and who took away his passport and confined him to house arrest. Um, so there, was, there were lots of tensions. The weathermen were very involved with LSD um, and, you know, but it's argued much to their detriment in terms of their effectiveness as a political group. So I don't know, I don't know that you can generalize about whether psychedelics had a politically constructive or, or destructive effect. Um, I haven't dug too deeply into that, but there are a lot of people who would say, I mean, there, there are people who actually believe the CIA distributed LSD to disarm the left um, and, and get people focused on their, their navels instead of on, on changing um, the world. On the other hand, President Nixon thought that LSD was the problem. Uh, and he, at one, in 1971, he called Timothy Leary the most dangerous man in America. You know, a washed up psychology professor is kind of remarkable. Um, he said the same thing about Daniel Ellsberg, so. His use of the word most was uh, unusual. Well, uh, since we're talking about uh, Nixon and the CIA, uh, I think it would be interesting to address uh, the kind of elephant in the room that the bad trip is. I mean, the bad trip having a, almost a mythological status as one of the reasons for the criminalization of uh, a lot of narcotics uh, that, that were psychedelics. Yeah, well, there's a few interesting things about the phenomenon of the bad trip. One was it was much less well known until 1964, 65. Um, and that before that, you get many fewer reports of bad trips. Um, and I think it's one of these feedback loops that at a certain point, you have this moral panic uh, to psychedelics. It begins around 65. It's, it's important to understand first that the drugs were not illegal then. They weren't illegal in California until 67 and federally till 1970. Um, and that their image was incredibly positive in the 50s. Time Life, uh, the Henry Luce Empire of all places, was a great promoter of LSD and other psychedelics. Um, Luce himself and Claire Booth Luce uh, were regular users of LSD. They worked with this psychiatrist in, a, in uh, Los Angeles and felt it was a really constructive uh, drug experience. And uh, in fact, Luce insisted that any articles dealing with psychedelics came to his desk so he could cut out any negative references in it. Um, it was all positive. And then they turned on a dime in 65. And there, there was almost this concerted... Um, uh, concern about about these drugs and stories started coming out and stories you've heard I mean people jumping out of windows uh, thinking they could fly or walking into traffic thinking that they could stop it um, people um, uh, staring at the Sun and going blind that was another story um, and uh, and chromosomes that that LSD would break your chromosomes um, Almost all of these stories were discredited. They were really urban legends. In the case of the Staring at the Sun, it was actually the commissioner of blindness, they had such a thing, in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, was concerned about LSD, and he put out a story that he later admitted he'd completely made up from whole cloth. Yet, the story being out there, the drugs being so suggestible, people then did it and stared at the sun and had problems. <laughs> So, so what, what begins as myth and then becomes real in this area is um, 
But a lot of bad tra I don't want to minimize it. I mean, there are LSD casualties. There, there were quite a few of them. There were people who were kicked into schizophrenia by their LSD experience. Would, they, would that have happened eventually? Probably, but it was the precipitating fact. Um, there were a couple people who walked into traffic and got run over. People did some really stupid things. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the famous case of the, the man who the CIA had given LSD to who jumped out of a window in New York, it appears now that he was pushed um, and that that was a cover story, um, a CIA cover story. Um, so, but bad trips did happen. And um, however, because of the nature of the drug and the fact that doctors hadn't seen a lot of it in 65, uh, and, and in the hate also, they misdiagnose a lot of panic reactions as psychotic breaks, because it looks like a psychotic break. And one of the interesting um, uh, tidbits I picked up in my research was I interviewed Andrew Weil, uh, who the, the doctor, holistic, speaking of holism, a great exponent of holistic health and diet and uh, medicine. Um, and he had graduated from Harvard Medical School in 68, 67, and went right to the hate and volunteered in the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, where they were seeing all these bad trips, because things got really bad in uh, late 67, uh, early, and especially in 68, and partly because speed had come into the hate, not just uh, LSD. And he had a lot of experience with psychedelics and um, from an early time, and he's, he's written uh, brilliantly about them. And um, he realized what was going on. And so he would come in, uh, he was a volunteer, he had his you know, white coat on and his clipboard, and he would take the, he would go into the little cubicle and talk to the person who was absolutely freaking out and convinced they were dying and they're losing their mind for all time. And he would, he would listen and realize they were having a panic reaction. And he would say, will you excuse me for a moment? There's someone in real trouble in the next room. And as soon as they heard those words, they relaxed and they were fine. <laughs> Suggestibility, again. Um, so, so the bad trip is complicated, and it becomes much more prevalent when the society is reacting against it, when the drugs become illegal, uh, than it was in the 50s. You just didn't read about bad trips in the 50s. Um, so I think that they're, you know, they're, they're pharmacological, but they're also historical. When I was uh, thinking of taking LSD, and I consulted with people, ever the academic, I did my research first. <laughs> And I talked to one friend, she says, oh, don't do it. I saw skulls hanging from trees, and I'm like, I don't want to see that. <laughs> and then I asked another friend, he said, oh, you should totally do it. He said, it's just the best ever. And so in terms of kind of like consequent life stories, that second friend is uh, now a police officer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then uh, another friend who uh, was, you know, maybe my druggiest friend is now running a very major company in the United Kingdom, which I will not mention. So, you know, there are subsequent life stories, you know. Well, Steve Jobs is, you know, he's, he's an interesting case. He spoke openly about his LSD use and that it shaped his aesthetic and, and uh, uh, was a somewhat of evangelical on the subject of LSD. But he was not the first. I mean, Silicon Valley had a, a, a deep history with these drugs going back to the 50s. Um, it was interesting that it took root there. Um, there was a group of engineers who were turned on to LSD in the, in the 50s, particularly at a company called Ampex, which was like the first real Silicon Valley company. They made magnetic uh, information storage and sound storage. And their, their head of strategic planning or something had been turned on to LSD, and he realized this is a, a terrific tool for uh, management and for um, uh, creativity and the early chip designers who were faced with an incredibly hard project. I mean, a chip is a really intricate structure. It's layered and you have to conceive of it in three dimensions. And before you have computers, of course, much harder to design. And um, uh, that there were some important chip designers who felt that they had gotten the key insights and were able to conceptualize this incredibly intricate three-dimensional space on LSD, and so one of the groups of researchers that um, that were in and around Stanford um, really came out of, they were engineers, um, and they were they, they had this interesting experience of, of being, as you imagine an engineer to be, to being these incredibly, um, you know, emotional, um, emotionally available people who really wanted to save the world. And that was one of the, the, the core um, LSD research groups came out of Ampex. 
uh, so Greg, you were mentioning uh, we were on talking on the phone the other day that then that and maybe this is something then I should ask Michael. Uh, is LSD finished or is it still circulating through Silicon Valley? Greg, you were mentioning that something called microdosing, which I don't know anything about, but. Yeah, I mean, one of the great, uh, there's so many paradoxes and ironies attached to these drugs, but this drug that we've been talking about is this radical shift in consciousness and, 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 and uh, a disturber of the status quo and leading to the anti-war movement has now, is now being turned into a productivity drug. Um, that people use to work better uh, rather than drop out. I mean, Leary would be turning over in his, well, he's in outer space, I guess, but, you know, turning over in his capsule um, <laughs> if he knew that this, had, this is what had happened. And that, so there's this very common practice in Silicon Valley of people taking a, a small, uh, almost sub-perceptual dose of LSD, 10, 10 micrograms, uh, every third day. And, and people report, there's no scientific research to support this, but um, uh, people report uh, you know, that they're much more um, fluid in their thinking and that it's this wonderful brain tonic. And, and, and um, Ayala Wall wrote a book recently about her, her depression. Yeah, I don't know what happened to this. Hello, hello? Can I borrow this? Um, so that there, but there will be research on microdosing. We'll, we'll find out if it really works, or you know, the the placebo effect is really important in these uh, with these drugs. And um, so the, anyway, there are lots of people in Silicon Valley um, and at big tech firms. And I, I've heard also that there are a couple tech firms where they actually use larger doses in their management training. Um, so it's an interesting. Um, it's it's part of the acceptance of the drugs in a way, but it's you know, to people who have a '60s orientation, it seems somewhat perverse. Be before we open it up to questions, I just have one last thing I'm very curious about. And, uh, you know, we hear now Silicon Valley is microdosing. There are these experiments in terms of therapeutics. Yet LSD, for example, is a category one drug. Uh, that means that according to the DEA, it has no potential uh, positive medical use. Uh, it, there are no protocols for its experimental use. Uh, and so how does that work? It seems to me that uh, the original criminalization of LSD uh, really was uh, very strategic because it made people in the Haight-Ashbury outlaws. So they became criminals. They just happened to be people who, uh, as a group, were uh, very strongly against the war in Vietnam. So uh, criminalization really was directed at that group. Uh, how does that work now? Are we seeing a kind of selective enforcement of laws because these happen to be white elites who are using the drug now? Uh, there's been no change uh, in the legal status of LSD. It's really important to keep that in mind. And you're right, it's a Schedule One drug, which means in the government's view is a high potential of abuse and no accepted medical value. Um, the research is disproving the, the, the latter contention. Um, they are finding it does have medical value. Um, and what the, the, the fate of it will be, assuming there, there's a, you know, there, there is a pilot studies, phase two, phase three studies to, to, um, to get a drug approved. If phase three studies of um, psilocybin are successful, um, th this will put enormous pressure on the DEA to, to change the classification. You know, opiates are uh, Schedule II. I mean, there's a, there's a way you can take dangerous drugs and put them in Schedule II, which allows doctors to prescribe them. So that is probably the long-term um, future, but you're right. I mean, right now, it's, uh, it's illegal. All these people are taking enormous chances with their, their liberty, and we have a you know, a, a government now that may revive the drug, drug war, but largely for the reasons you describe. I mean, there, there are categories of people that you can vary, that, you, that are troublesome to the government, and um, psychedelics was one. Obviously, marijuana was a much bigger one, and, and, uh, and heroin another, and, and you know, mass incarceration was about criminalizing the black population and using dr the drug laws to do it. Um, LSD since the 60s has not been a big part of the drug war and not a real focus of government effort because it's relatively small in numbers. Without, in fact, without marijuana, the drug war has a lot of trouble 
sustaining itself. Um, but yeah, it, the status is still, um, these are you know, very serious penalties attached to these drugs. The, there are, uh, but, but for the researchers, they're all operating with DEA and FDA approval. Um, you, you can still get approval to do studies. It, it's very time consuming, but there are groups at, um, at Hopkins, at um, NYU, at University of Alabama, and soon at UCSF, actually, that have gotten permission to experiment uh, with psilocybin. Um, but they're they're subject to incredible. They have to like weigh it every day and report in, and you know it's very very carefully controlled. Well, let's open it up to uh, questions from the audience, and there will be some microphones that will be circulating. And I'd just like to say that you know many of us who are old enough have some very interesting LSD experiences to share. So. Uh, it, Rather than take a lot of time, for example, to tell you the way I set my hiking boots on fire by trying to keep my feet warm at one point <laughs> in the mountains, uh, let's uh, try to make sure that these really are questions, okay? So, um, <laughs> microphones circulating. You've got one, someone yeah. right there. Back row. And Thank you. I wanted to ask, my understanding of the history of tobacco is that tobacco was used in small amounts in this kind of ceremonial way in, uh, among the Native Americans. And now you can go in a drugstore and you know <laughs> buy these cigarettes. And in, in my lifetime, I've seen thousands and thousands of people on the street with those. So I wanted to ask about the history of psychedelics and, and marijuana in particular. Is this, has this also had that kind of a transition from being a, uh, uh, a ceremonial uh, uh, device to being something just on the shelf? Well, um, I mean, many drugs have gone through a trajectory like that. I mean, psilocybin, for example, was used ceremonially and for uh, divination purposes uh, by Indians in Central America for we don't know how long, for thousands of years. It was suppressed by the um, conquistadors who saw this as a pagan nature worship, people worshiping mushrooms. And uh, they drove it underground, and it stayed underground for 500 years. And uh, amazing that it ever resurfaced, but it did in the 50s. Um, so yeah, and tobacco is used very differently by Native American populations, um, and in a ceremonial way, not in a habitual way. The social context of, of drugs are very important to their, to their effects. I mean, they're things that are, be, can become quite toxic in our society, where we tend to turn everything into a consumer good um, and are much more uh, likely to use it in an addictive manner because it's, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, and the religious context or the ceremonial context of drugs is, among other things, uh, a social container that, that, that uh, guards against abuse. And uh, because it's done only on certain days, at certain times, people can't get addicted. Um, and I think one of the things that happened with psychedelics when they landed in the 60s is that they didn't have a container. Um, they, you know, they were just so new. I mean, the LSD was invented or discovered in the 40s and, and introduced in the 50s. Uh, psilocybin came into our society in 57. Uh, and um, uh, so how do you use it? When do you have it? Do you do it in a group or you do it individually? There weren't any rules. And that's one of the reasons you get drug abuse, when there are no rules around drugs. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like uh, kids in college binging on alcohol. I mean, adults have a lot of problems with alcohol too, but there's a set of mores and manners of how you drink and when you drink and how much you drink. Um, and that as soon as uh, we raised the drinking age as high as we did, uh, Kids were, instead of having, um, you know, drinking sherry with your Don in college, you're, you're, um, you're, you're binging, you know, in, in, the, uh, in your apartment. Um, so I think controlling drugs through social mores is really, really important. I think something that I'm going to learn after today, I mean, it's, it, it's now so obvious, context is everything. Absolutely. It, you know, whether, so the original kind of ritualistic use of these things or to the degree to which the art that we see on display here is produced at a certain moment, you know. But it's, it's all about context, definitely. 
And uh, another great example of that is the um, Elo Eleusian Mysteries. Uh, you know, in ancient Greece, there was a, a drug cult that um, all the leading lights of Greek civilization apparently participated in, and there was a psychedelic drug. We don't know what it was. And everybody was sworn to secrecy, and you could only use this drug once a year. It was a psychedelic of some kind. People described visions. I mean, Plato and Aristotle wrote, wrote about their experiences. Um, and you would see the afterlife, and it was a really foundational practice for a thousand years in Greek um, civilization. One time, somebody got access to the drugs outside of the ceremony and had a party, <laughs> and they were promptly executed. Um, so you only did this in the context of this religious ritual. I have um, a comment and then a question. And it's sort of a social historical comment. In the rise of the counterculture and the rise of drug use, um, I think the uh, availability of birth control pills was very important in opening up the culture to sort of a, a new way of experiencing the world because you didn't have such a strong rise of the nuclear family. So I just think that is something you might consider in your historical context. And my question is, um, for some of us who are very interested in, in experiencing LSD again, uh, where can we find a good guide? <laughs> You know, since I wrote this New Yorker piece, um, there been I've been contacted by a lot of people with the same question, and um, and it's very awkward. Um, <laughs> but there, if you if you ask around enough and look around, there there is a there is a network of uh, underground therapists who are doing work very much like what goes on in the um, in the uh, university trials. And um, you'll find people in your community who are, you know, doing this work and uh, and very serious about it. I mean, they're not just drug dealers; they're they're actual guides and therapists. Um, but it would not be, a, a, you know, I've interviewed some of these people, and but you know, I'm sworn to confidentiality. Um, you spoke a little bit about the um, individual bad trip, but I was wondering if there is something you would say about, for example, the collective bad trip. Probably an example would be like Charles Manson, and, and there may have been right. other experiences like that. Yeah, I, I haven't looked too closely at the Manson episode, but it did come up in one of my interviews with the, the neuroscientist I was telling you about, who had this concern that you could use these drugs Th they induce a kind of plasticity in the mind and, um, and, and suggestions that, it's almost like hypnosis, and suggestions that you plant during uh, an acid trip can um, become really lodged in a powerful way. And um, so it's not implausible that these drugs could be used to brainwash people and that a charismatic character, as Charles Manson apparently was, um, could, could potentially use these drugs in that way. Um, I don't know enough about the story to say with any kind of certainty, but again, it goes back to that suggestibility and, um, and a, a malign use, um, such as the CIA attempted to do, uh, is, is by no means out of the question. But, uh, essentially, the CIA was unsuccessful at harnessing the drug, so it makes me wonder... As far as we know. As far as we know. <laughs> there we go. The paranoid worldview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about bad trips. Um, but uh, it just makes me think that perhaps it's the charismatic uh, figure uh, as much or more than the drug was what was going on with Manson. You know. uh, up there in the back? Yes. So I was, I've been really intrigued at thus far in this conversation. You've been treating psilocybin and acid as one in the same category, when in fact they have very different natural histories. I mean, one is comes from a fungus and the other is produced in a lab. And I was wondering if, if you, especially you, Michael, um, could elucidate some more that distinction um, in terms of the cultural role in history of the two psychedelics. Sure, yeah, I have been using them interchangeably. And um, uh, a couple reasons for that. I mean, they are very different. One is 
more organic <laughs> and, and, and uh, liked by many people for that reason more. I mean, it does come from a mushroom. Um, it's important to understand, though, LSD is derived from a fungus as well, originally. It's um, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, the name of it is slipping my mind. Who? Ergot, yes. And in fact, uh, and this is a, a fungus that infects grain and that um, at, at various times in history, people have eaten infected grain and had talk about collective bad trips. I mean, whole communities have kind of gone crazy. And um, uh, But they, they're different in their effects in this sense that psilocybin is shorter acting. LSD is a much longer trip. Um, the researchers are using psilocybin for two, two main reasons rather than LSD. In England, they're using LSD a little bit more because it doesn't have quite the political and cultural baggage it carries here. But they're, you know, they don't, so few people know what psilocybin is that it's less controversial to do research on it. You're not going to be attacked by, you know, people standing up in Congress and saying your tax dollars are using, you know, being used for LSD research. Um, so that's a, a real plus, and the fact that since it is shorter acting, if you're administering a trip to somebody, uh, you know, it takes six hours with psilocybin and 12 hours with LSD, and, and the therapists like to get home in time for dinner. Um, so there's, there's a very practical reason they're using psilocybin. Um, psilocybin does have this uh, New World legacy that I mentioned earlier. It was used by uh, native populations throughout Mexico and Central America for a very long time. Um, there were, the, 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 people are still finding mushroom stones, these, these carved stones that symbolize the, the mushroom. And um, it was used only in a ceremonial context for healing and, and divination. Uh, and only certain people could administer it. Even though the mushrooms uh, grew pretty, you know, were not hard, too hard to find. Um, and uh, whereas LSD was discovered by a chemist uh, named Albert Hoffman, a Swiss chemist, and there's a wonderful story. He wrote a book called LSD, My Problem Child, where he tells the, um, the story of the discovery. It was, it was quite accidental. He was, trying to, he was looking for a drug. Ergot was used by women during childbirth to stop bleeding. And um, he was looking for a drug that would help with that and accidentally got some on his fingers and had this, um, this you know, strange trip. And he really, it wasn't quite a trip, but this strange mental reaction. And then he gave himself some of it. Um, a, a huge dose, because uh, most drugs, the dose is measured in milligrams, and I, as I've been saying, this drug is, is measured in micrograms, I mean millionths of a gram. I mean, it's just, it's one of the most uh, potent of all molecules. Um, they're also similar in one last sense, uh, in that they work on the same receptors. There's a, a receptor in the cortex called, uh, well, actually, it's, it's all over your body, but it's heavily represented in the cortex called the... Um, uh, H2A uh, receptor, and this, uh, and so they both lock, all, all classical psych psychedelics uh, bind to that receptor. Uh, MDMA doesn't, that's one of the reasons it's not considered a classical psychedelic, although some people do call it a psychedelic. Thank you for calling on me. Uh, so, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of both of you, and, and this is a great presentation. Uh, I'm also uh, a pro-psychedelic um, sort of advocate in a certain way, in, given my history and a lot of my friends' history. I'm also a psychiatrist, and I do feel that what's happened today in some ways is a minimization of the dangers. Uh, repeatedly, you've been asked questions about bad trips, and, um, you know, various kinds of side effects. And many of us know people who have become psychotic permanently so. And so, Michael, I'd want to know the data on that. And um, I think it's an important thing to acknowledge. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and I, th I, th I think your criticism is fair. Um, there's not a lot of data on it is one of the problems, and it's one of the things that I'm uh, digging into as part of this book. Um, so much of it is anecdotal, um, and so much of it is, um, you know, again, what I was, the point I was making about schizophrenia is people who are at risk of it, um, they're very bad candidates to use these drugs, and in fact, they're very carefully screened out of the, um, the drug trials. 
And we need to distinguish recreational use, so-called. Uh, it's, it's not a very good word for what we're describing. Um, uh, and um, clinical use. And there is a big difference. Um, in all the clinical trials that have happened in the modern era, and there's you know, probably a 1,000 people who've been dosed, there have not been any serious adverse effects, even though people had some very difficult experiences, um, which the doctors involved in these, the therapists, don't call bad trips. They call challenging trips. Uh, because if you're with a therapist, those negative experiences can be incredibly positive, can be, you know, used, I mean, for, trauma comes up, childhood trauma will come up. It's a, it's a very bad trip, but it's, as you would well understand, is, is on the road, recovering that memory is on the road to psychological healing. So what, is that a bad trip? What do we call that? Um, so there's a real distinction between what happens in the clinical environment and what happens when you have people of uh, you know very different psychological constitutions using these drugs, not sure what they're getting exactly, whether there's any other drugs mixed in, how big the dose is, and what is the setting? I mean, you know, are people uh, walking around in a city, crossing streets, or are they you know in a safe place with people who aren't taking the drugs? Um, so. There's no question that they're they're very serious drugs and they can be really dangerous. Um, there are some kind of large surveys of populations, hundreds of thousands of people who have filled out surveys about their drug use and their interesting conclusions that can be drawn from that. Uh, lower incidence of suicide in populations who have used psychedelics. That's interesting. Um, lower interest, lower incidence of drug abuse and addiction. Um, that there's so some of these um, giant surveys have suggested that they're either the kind of people. I mean, I, either the kind of people who use psychedelics, or this, or because of the psychedelics themselves, that it's having somewhat protective effect on some mental health issues. Um, yet, without question, there are people who have had uh, psychotic breaks, and, and, and as I've begun to talk about this, I've often heard from people who've witnessed that. And uh, so, yeah, it shouldn't be minimized. Thanks for making that point. Maybe just while the mic is moving to somebody else, and I, I mean, thank you for that you know, very serious comment, and when I was asking uh, people who were doing acid in the 90s about the effect. Uh, a story that stuck with me, a friend of a friend who was doing a lot, and he says, well, you know, he says, each time I take it, it's wonderful. I feel like all the wires in my head are disconnected, and it's wonderful for a while. He says, but each time afterwards, I feel like not all the wires are going back in the same place. <laughs> and at the, at the same time, it's, it's really funny, but I could imagine, you know, is this like some sort of slow, long-term effect of the drug, and that, that, that it was something that he was self-reflecting. Well, it's interesting he should use that metaphor because, in fact, the wiring of the brain is temporarily changed. Um, and there have been some really, um, there have been efforts to image this. And the, the connections of the brain, um, which normally pass through this kind of hierarchical system through the default mode network and there's a transit hub, um, this, this is shut down for a period of time, allowing parts of the brain that wouldn't ordinarily communicate directly to communicate directly. Now, in the right hands, um, this can be a very positive thing. I mean, a, a new set of connections, even tried temporarily, can be a new meaning, a new insight. Um, uh, and that, in general, the brain puts itself back together pretty much the way it is, but not entirely. And, and that can be a positive thing, though, because if you have people who's, I mean, we're using this metaphor of wiring, which isn't exactly right, but they're, you know, people with addiction or depression or, or, um, or in OCD or anxiety have a very rigid wiring and these deep grooves of thought, this rumination that they're stuck in, and that the fact that the experience breaks those patterns temporarily is what gives them relief. Um, so it can work both ways. Uh, it can be a very positive thing to rewire your brain uh, or a negative thing. I mean, mental illness is you know, often badly wired brains. Um, hi. Great discussion. Thank you. Um, I'm, you uh, Michael, you said early on that it wasn't necessarily the drugs that prompted the, the opening, but that 
something was already gone, sort of the zeitgeist that LSD amplified. And I'm wondering what you think, given, well, I, I'm not sure exactly what the zeitgeist is now, but at least in the US, it feels to me as if it's not as lovely and loving as it was in the 60s. Um, mm. What you feel would happen if there were a resurgence of psychedelic use? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's very hard to, to uh, speculate about. Um, you know, there, I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment. Would you have had a, cult a counterculture without psychedelics? I think you would have. I think that the, the war in Vietnam would have given you that. And, um, and the fact that you had this giant generation of baby boomers um, and this affluence um, and this interregnum in time where people didn't have to necessarily work. There, there was enough space in the culture to drop out for a while. There was enough money around to drop out for a while for the middle class. Um, and, and something you alluded to earlier is that this is not, the use of these drugs didn't cut across all um, groups in this cult. It tended to be pretty elite and pretty white. Um, which is interesting because it's not like they were expensive. They were incredibly inexpensive for a period of time. So something else was driving that. Um, and it may have been, you know, you need a lot of leisure time to use these drugs. I mean, it takes, you know, it, it, it sucks up a whole day. And uh, not everybody was in a position to do that. Um, but I don't know what would happen now. I mean, as, as I was suggesting, it would have a different set of meanings. It could, it could amplify very negative things, too. I mean, it's, I don't think we can say with any certainty. Um, a neuroscientist published a, uh, an op-ed recently about it would be really useful for Trump to have an LSD trip. <laughs> and, you know, there's a kind of rigidity of thinking there that could, be, could use some lubrication. Um, so. That is a, a really, really interesting question. And, um, you know, I'm an historian, so I kind of catch up with the news 30 years after it's happened. But one of the things that I've got to learn to do now is to pay attention to the news right now and to try and figure out where the culture is going. And, um, you know, you allude, of course, to our current political circumstance. And is it the case that right now we are seeing cultural reactions to a move towards a borderless world? that the borderless world is something that we could trace historically. The dream of it is something that we can certainly trace back to the 60s, the whole Earth, LSD, all one, and so on. And that that has now moved its way through the system, and that I now begin to fear that the hip thing is going to become to imagine a bordered world again. Homes and homelands and territories. That slide that I showed at the end of uh, my presentation shows a border becoming hip. And uh, this morning uh, on the radio, I heard a really disturbing segment of news from France uh, that amongst the key 18 to 25 demographic in France, Marine Le Pen uh, is now in front. And they interview a couple of young people. And yeah, they're articulate. And I could quite imagine a cultural turn in which homelands and nations become really interesting for that segment. Bring on the acid. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, and I should say there are a lot of people in the psychedelic community that I've been uh, interviewing that, that would agree with that and that, that this is the antidote the system needs to encourage people to recognize their kinship. And we are, we are definitely fragmenting into um, groups. And this is not just on the right, this is on the left too. I mean, identity politics, you know, we're, we're, we're building up borders around groups and places. And, and um, to the extent you can generalize about the effect of psychedelics, yeah, I mean, it, and MDMA for that reason, that it, that it, it tends to encourage people to focus on their similarities rather than their differences. Just uh, thought about the potential um, radical change in politics that these uh, uh, medicines could bring. Um, the uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD trials are 
now uh, going to phase three. Um, and the phase twos were just radically effective for uh, PTSD. And if you think of trauma as being uh, a source of much of our politics, actually, uh, of, um, of the problems with our, dr our drug uh, abuse, if you go to, uh, I'm a psychiatrist, and anybody who uh, has any problems with substance abuse usually has some level of trauma uh, in, their, in their history. So if you find uh, any treatment that is radically effective for trauma, it, has, it can have tremendous implications for our politics if it actually can get di diffused into the uh, population. So that's, that's actually a, a, a real you know, hopeful uh, aspect, I think, uh, in terms of the, the, the place that psychedelics, and this particular psychedelic, and this particular kind of therapy, because it's around trauma, because trauma is often p political too, um, so much of the um, trauma that people experience is from poverty and being d uh, displaced, and you know. So, um, just just a comment and a thought about that. I, no, I, I think you make a very good point, and that um, a lot of uh, the MDMA focus has been on trauma, treating trauma, uh, especially in in war veterans, um, but also uh, victims of sexual abuse. And but this also is becomes up. This is ayahuasca, is, which we haven't talked about, is being used also uh, by um, doctors who've got patients who often with addictions that have underlying traumas and um, uh, and have by surfacing the traumas and also the drugs seem to allow people to uh, to take out the memory, deal with it in a with a, with less emotional charge and then consolidate it in a slightly different way. And I've seen videos of some of that MDMA therapy, and it's, it really is incredible. Um, and that's a very encouraging development.